We are saved on the basis of Jesus and his perfect life and his sin-bearing death and his glorious resurrection and that alone. But our righteous acts will be the evidence that Jesus is at work within us and empowering us to live transformed lives. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. And uh, today we continue a message we began last time called Attaining True Righteousness. And Jonathan, I I think I heard you just say that while our good works are not going to save us or make us right with God, if we are right with God, if we do have that relationship with Him, we actually should see some good works in our lives. Well, that's right. I think worldly religion, man-made religion, says you you work hard at your ethics so that God will accept you. And the Christian gospel says that God accepts us on the basis of Jesus and him alone, and he accepts us and makes us righteous in order that we might learn to live righteously with the Spirit's help. So it's completely backwards from what we might anticipate or expect. So for the person who says, Jonathan, I, I hear you say that, but you know, I'm not inclined to want to do good works. Would that be a reason for them to maybe at least ask the question, where do they actually stand with God? Well, I, th- I think I think you're on to something there, Steve, because sometimes it's easy to buy into the myth that, you know, the Christian gospel is a is a ticket to heaven and nothing more. But what we learn in the scriptures and what Jesus teaches us in the Gospels is that he wants a people who are transformed to live a different kind of life. And if we have no interest in that, no appetite for that, we need we need to really ask, have I understood the teaching of Jesus and and what is his agenda for my life and for for his people? Well, we're going to look at his teaching today in Matthew chapter five as we continue a message called Attaining True Righteousness. Here is Jonathan. A few years ago, back in the UK, I realized it would be quite helpful to try and get Canadian citizenship for our children. I knew we might come over this way at some point, so I thought it could prove useful if we had secured that. I called up the Canadian High Commission in London and asked about that, what would be involved in getting citizenship for my children. The very helpful person at the end of the phone explained to me that because I was a Canadian citizen born in Canada, the children were, in fact, already Canadian citizens. Even though they'd been born abroad, that didn't matter. Because they belong to me, they share my status of citizenship. In the eyes of the Canadian government, I imparted that to them. One of the great truths of the gospel is that because believers belong to the Lord Jesus, because Christian believers are joined to the Lord Jesus, because we are in Christ, to use a term that the Apostle Paul likes to use, we share his righteous status before the Father. We enjoy the benefit of his record of righteous living, his perfect law-keeping. Because we belong to him, because we're joined to him by his spirit, because we are in Christ, his record of perfect law-keeping, of moral perfection, that record belongs to us as his people. And because his record belongs to us, God the Father looks on us as having perfectly kept his law. And so his perfect standards are met for each believer. And so, amazingly, as we look at the perfect life of Jesus, the morally beautiful life of Jesus in the Gospels, as we gaze upon that life and see it glow off the page, we are actually seeing and beholding and reading the record that applies to each one of us if we belong to Christ. Jesus fulfills the moral law by keeping it perfectly. That is a very wonderful truth and a very great reassurance for the believer. But it's not the whole picture. There's more to come. Added to Jesus' perfect law-keeping, he also fulfills the law by bearing its penalty. And that's our third point. Although it's becoming less and less common, quite a number of jurisdictions in the world still have the death penalty on their books as the appropriate punishment for certain types of crime. 
usually murder in the first degree, although not exclusively. That's still the case, I understand, in 35 U.S. states. Now, if the law of the land says that a murderer, duly convicted of murder in the first degree, should be executed, if that's the law of the land, you might say that the law of the land is fulfilled when that murderer is executed. The execution itself is a fulfillment of the law. The Old Testament law makes it crystal clear that sin leads to death, that the wages of sin is death. That was the message that God gave Adam and Eve right back in the Garden of Eden. And certain crimes in the Old Testament, under the Old Testament law, were explicitly capital crimes and deserved execution right away. Now, the sacrificial system at the temple in Israel acted as a regular illustration, actually, of this principle. It illustrated for us the seriousness of sin. Animals would die in the place of people to pay the price of sin for which the right penalty is death. Now, that's the Old Testament background here. But in light of that, consider where we are in the story of Jesus' ministry. Back in chapter 4 of Matthew, he invited repentant sinners to come and to follow him. He was willing to accept them. At the beginning of chapter 5, he pronounced a series of blessings on those who mourn their sin and who have a poverty of spirit. But how is it that the Lord Jesus can welcome repentant sinners to come follow him? How can he pronounce a blessing upon people who are guilty? Surely, since sin leads to judgment and leads to death under the law of God, welcoming sinful people into the kingdom and even pronouncing a blessing upon them, surely that means that Jesus has just torn up the law and thrown it away. Surely that's the implication here. Surely he's just saying, well, it doesn't matter anymore. I've done away with it. He's loosened God's standards. He's a more modern leader, a more relaxed one. Well, no, he insists that he has not come, verse 17, to abolish the law with its consequences and its punishments. He hasn't come to tear it all up. All of it is going to be accomplished. He's come to fulfill it. Last week, we thought about how the Gospels are cross-centered, cross-shaped books. The teaching ministry of Jesus throughout the Gospels is setting things up so that we will understand the death and resurrection of Jesus when those events come to pass. And again and again, as we read the teaching of Jesus throughout the Gospels, we find that his words make fullest sense, come into focus and clarity once we read them in light of the cross. That's a repeated pattern. Now, let's just take that principle and that insight and let's apply it to verses 17 and 18. Let's just think about those verses explicitly in light of the cross. Here's what Jesus says, just remember. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, nothing said in the law, no punishment of any kind, no consequence of sin, nothing will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Now, as I read those words, my mind turns very naturally to the words that Jesus spoke on the cross. What did he say? It is finished. It's accomplished. The job has been done. The requirements of the law have been met fully and finally, perfectly and completely. The standards of God's law have been met, and they've been satisfied. The penalty for sin, the penalty set out in the law and required by the law, it has been met at Calvary. The law of the Lord in the Old Testament is fulfilled for you and fulfilled for me because Jesus has stepped into our shoes, taken our place, and died the death we deserve. He's borne that legal penalty for our sin. And as far as we're concerned, the law is satisfied and we are justified. Jesus fulfills the law of God by bearing its penalty in the place of his people. The fourth way in which Jesus fulfills the moral law of the Old Testament is finally that he calls a people who live righteously. It's easy to imagine that the Old Testament law 
presents to us a God who has an unusual interest in minute details and regulations, that he's sitting up there in heaven with a very precise checklist of rules and regulations and just watching us, waiting to catch us out and see if we'll slip up. I mentioned earlier the rules of the road that every young driver has to learn. It's easy to imagine that God is the rule maker sitting in heaven with his legal checklist, waiting to catch us out, a bit like the people who supervise and officiate at driver's tests in the Ministry of Transportation. Most of us have taken a driver's exam at some point, so you'll remember the experience. In fact, a good number of people here in this room of statistics tell any truth have failed a driver's exam at some point, so you may well have a particular view on this subject. I actually have my own thoughts on this particular matter. I passed my driving tests first time round, age 16, here in Ontario. And that was a source of some satisfaction for me. I was pleased about that. Many of my friends failed. And I have to say, it, it felt pretty good just to sail through with no trouble whatsoever. When I moved to the UK, I had to take another test over there to get a UK license. Now, just by way of background, it's important to know that the UK has one of the hardest uh, driving tests in the world. <laughs> they have a failure rate of about 57%. That's important to know. Anyway, I. I prepared for that a little bit. I didn't do too much preparation because I knew I would be fine. And I'd say I drove very well indeed through the test. <clears throat> I'd been driving for a number of years by then and I'd established a number of very good habits. <laughs> we reached the end of the test and I looked over to the examiner just waiting to be congratulated. <clears throat> and maybe for him just to hand over the license. Instead, I was informed in a very somber tone that I had failed dismally. The reasons given were, to my mind, ridiculous. When the examiner explained what it was he had wanted me to do and what I'd failed to do, it was pretty clear to me that if I'd done what he wanted and not what I, in fact, did, I would have posed a great deal of danger to those around me. But he had the power over that checklist in his clipboard. There were too many X's on the list, and so that was that. Now, it's possible to imagine that the God of heaven is sitting up there with his checklist and he enjoys putting X's in the boxes. But the scriptures make it clear that God's purpose in the giving of the law has nothing to do with checklists and X's in boxes. That's not what he's up to. No, God's purpose throughout the scriptures has been to create and set apart a people who will live in such a way that they will bring glory to him. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. Our message today is called Attaining True Righteousness. You joined us a little late. We're in Matthew chapter 5, looking at the Sermon on the Mount, and we'll continue this in just a moment. But if you did join us late, you want to go back and listen to what you missed, or maybe you have to leave us early, you can always come to our website and you can listen to each and every program there. Our website address is EncounterTheTruth.org. Another way to listen is the Encounter the Truth app. It's free, and you'll find it at your favorite app store. Just simply look for Encounter the Truth. Well, let's get back to the message. Once again, here is Jonathan. In a very significant passage in the prophecy of Isaiah, God sets out his purpose in sending salvation to his people. It's actually a very significant passage for us as we look at Matthew chapter 5, because it seems pretty likely that Jesus had this passage in mind as he began the Sermon on the Mount. It's a passage that Jesus quotes elsewhere in the scriptures. It is quite clearly a passage that points forward to him. I'm going to read a few verses here from the start of Isaiah 61. It may even appear on the screen. And as I do so, just to keep in mind what we saw last week from the beginning of Matthew chapter 5, from the Beatitudes where Jesus blesses the poor in spirit and he blesses those who mourn their sin. Isaiah 61 and verse 1, it says this, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and to provide for those who grieve in Zion. And then down to the end to verse 3, they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. The Lord's purpose in setting apart and saving and blessing a people is that they will become a people who are marked by righteousness, oaks of righteousness, who are marked by godly living. 
and who will be for the display of the Lord's splendor. The nations of the world are to look at the people of God and say, wow, what an amazing, what a splendid God they must serve. Now, that's the great purpose of God. That's what He's doing. That's what He's up to. And Jesus makes it clear in His sermon here that this great purpose of God is being fulfilled in Him and through Him and through His work, through His kingdom, through His ministry. The Lord Jesus Himself keeps the law perfectly, and He dies for our failure to keep the law perfectly. Now, that doesn't mean that the Lord Jesus has given up on calling a people who will live in such a way as to bring glory to Him. Quite the opposite. Verse 19, anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great. In the kingdom of heaven, in the realm where Jesus Christ is king, those who keep the moral law of God as taught by Jesus, those people will be called great. And those who break the law and who teach others to do the same, they will be called least in the kingdom. Within the kingdom of God, obedience to God's law distinguishes people. It's going to be significant. Now, that comes as a bit of a surprise. But what Jesus says in verse 20 is even more of a surprise. It's even more shocking, I think. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. The Pharisees were a group within Judaism, a kind of party within Judaism, who took law-keeping very seriously indeed. They were good law-keepers on one level. They were theologically conservative. They weren't the radicals. They weren't the liberals. They were known to be morally upright pillars of the community, teachers of the Word of God. These were the highly observant Jews of their day, the pillars of orthodoxy. And Jesus here insists that unless our righteousness, yours and mine, surpasses that of the Pharisees, the most particular law keepers of the day, we certainly will not enter the kingdom of heaven. It would be just great to find some way of believing that Jesus isn't talking about our behavior here in verse 20. That would be a lot easier. It would be nice to think that he is just talking about perhaps the gift of the status of righteousness that we've just been talking about, that he gives us through his death and his resurrection. That would be a whole lot easier to digest. But the context of these verses tells us that Jesus is interested in behavior here. He must be. He's going to spend the next 28 verses of chapter 5 talking all about behavior. He's going to show us what this greater righteousness is going to look like in our lives, obeying the law, not at the surface level, but from the heart. He's saying here in verse 20 that our righteous living, the evidence of righteousness in our lives, needs to be above even that of the Pharisees. But how does all this fit together? What's the, what's the big picture here? How does this all make sense? There is, I think, a stunted and ultimately false version of Christianity that is very popular and that we would all like to believe and to follow on one level. It's the version of the Christian gospel that says that Jesus died to save us from hell and to welcome us to heaven, and that because he died for our sin to save us from hell and to welcome us from heaven, we can simply sit back, put our feet up now, and wait for heaven. Our living in the here and now doesn't really matter. It's not terribly significant. Now, we all like that version of the gospel, and some of us will be functionally believing it and living it. I've prayed a prayer when I was seven. I've lived more or less as I please since then, but I know I am going to heaven. I prayed a prayer 20 years ago. My life hasn't changed a great deal since then. I've, to be honest, continued in some of the same patterns of sin ever since that day. But I did pray that prayer. I wrote the date in my Bible, and I still have the Bible, so I'm safe and dry. I'm fine. And if that's our understanding, and if that's our belief, and how common that is, Jesus says this to us. You do need to think again. 
For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's his wake-up call. That's his warning for us. Now, think again about God's bigger purpose and his bigger picture here that we were talking about just a moment ago. His purpose in salvation was never simply to transfer people from the road to hell and put them on the road to heaven. That was never his ultimate aim. His purpose was to redeem and to set apart a people who would be oaks of righteousness for the display of his splendor to all the world. That's what God has always been up to. His purpose was to create a transformed and obedient and holy people who would be for his glory. In order to do that, he needed to deal with our sin and he needed to deal with our guilt at Calvary, and he did that. He needed to make us right with himself through Jesus. And then he needed to fill us with his spirit and change our hearts and enable us to live a new kind of life. And now that he's done all that through the gospel, the evidence that you and I have been saved by Jesus, that his righteous record has been applied to us, that we are now righteous people, right with the Father, the evidence that we've been filled by his spirit the evidence of all that is a life that is growing in righteousness, a life that is marked by righteousness in increasing degree. Now, we need to be clear. Our own works of righteousness will never save us. We are saved on the basis of Jesus and his perfect life and his sin-bearing death and his glorious resurrection, and that alone but our righteous acts will be the evidence, the necessary evidence that we have been saved, evidence that Jesus is at work within us and empowering us to live transformed lives. Over the coming weeks, we're going to be thinking about particular areas of our lives where Jesus will call us to this greater righteousness, obedience from the heart and not just at the level of the letter of the law. But as we finish this morning, let me just plant the seed of challenge in general terms. Let me invite each one of us over the course of today to chew over verse 20 and simply to ask, are there areas of your life or of my life where we're clearly believing and clearly living out a gospel of cheap grace, thinking that our behavior it doesn't matter that much, God doesn't really care? He's not particularly interested. Thinking that because we're covered by the death of Jesus, everything's okay, and it doesn't matter how we live. So easy to fall into that way of thinking, but we need to be very careful. If there are those areas where we've decided that sin doesn't matter, that righteousness isn't required, the Lord Jesus warns us in verse 20 not to take that lightly. The New Testament makes it very clear that we'll never be perfect this side of heaven. We're never going to be sinless until he takes us there. And that's not what Jesus is saying here. That's not what he's requiring. But he is requiring us in verse 20 to examine our hearts and our lives very carefully. Have we really understood and really received the gift of salvation? And if so, are we living appropriately? living with increasing righteousness, increasing evidence of his gift of righteousness and the gift of his spirit within us. Jonathan Griffiths with a message called Attaining True Righteousness, the second in our series, God's Blueprint for a New Society, where we're taking a look at the Sermon on the Mount. If you want to make sure you don't miss a future broadcast, come to the website. You can sign up to podcast the program. Our website address, EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, Encounter the Truth is a listener-supported program. We do depend on your generosity to keep the program on this station. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to send you a book from Elizabeth Elliot. It's called Through Gates of Splendor. Now, this tells the story of how Elizabeth's husband, Jim, and four other missionary young men traveled into the jungles of Ecuador to share the gospel and ended up losing their lives at the end of a spear. We'd love to send you a copy of this book as you give a gift of any amount. Find out more or give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at 1-833-99-TRUTH. That's 833-998-7884 or EncounterTheTruth.org. Thanks for listening. For Jonathan, 
And for our producer, Mark Breda, I'm Steve Hiller, and I hope you'll join us next time.